Hey, everybody, it's Chris Widener, and you are listening to the American Freedom Tour podcast, where we bring you conservative icons, people who are out there hitting the streets, doing their best to help the conservative movement. And today we have our youngest guest ever. Uh, he is a college student, America's most famous college conservative. CJ Pearson is joining us. CJ, thanks for joining us. Well, thank you so much for having me, Chris. It's a pleasure to be here. Absolutely. Now, um, CJ goes to University of Alabama, Roll Tide, and uh, I've actually been to a game there at uh, University of, of Alabama. My daughter also goes to school there, and uh, so we love it down there in Tuscaloosa. A lot of real good conservatives down there in Alabama. Um, now, you, CJ, you have hundreds of thousands of social media followers. You've spoken at great conservative conferences, you're, you're out there, people know who you are, you're making a difference. But people are probably saying, how do you become a famous conservative, you know, uh, um, influencer at 20 years old? Are you even 20 yet? I'm 19. You're 19. Okay, by, by the time you're 19, how do you do this? And you've got a really interesting, unique story. So let's take some time and just talk about how you got to where you are now. Uh, tell us the story. And before you do, tell people where they can find you uh, if they're interested in connecting with you. Yeah, well, definitely. Well, thank you again, Chris, for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, and, and for all those listening, they can definitely keep up with me on social media, on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, all under the name CJ Pearson. Uh, my handle on Twitter and Instagram is the CJ Pearson, and I look forward uh, to seeing you guys there. Um, you know, it, it's so interesting talking about kind of the political journey that I've had because it really did start um, at, and this always sounds so far-fetched if you want to tell them this story, but it started in the second grade. Um, and that was the 2008 presidential election. I was around six or seven years old at the time, um, but our teacher had an assignment for the class. She wanted us to do whatever good citizen at the time uh, was doing. She wanted us to research the candidates. She wanted us to watch the debates, read the newspaper. At the end of that week, we were going to cast our vote for who we believe should be the next president of the United States. And I remember watching uh, this debate one night. This was a general election debate. It was, you know, of course, then Senator McCain and, and then Senator Obama um, kind of duking it out on stage. And, uh, you know, this was back, uh, this was a CNN debate with Candy Crowley. I remember it pretty vividly. And I remember sitting on the floor uh, of my mom's bedroom and just watching the TV and just thinking like, wow, like, I don't know what these people are talking about. Again, I'm six or seven years old, uh, but what they were talking about was important. And I could tell by, you know, just the sophistication of everything that was going on, you know, the way that they were talking, the way they were carrying themselves, that these were the types of men that were leading America or guiding our country somewhere, good, bad, or indifferent. And, uh, you know, at the end of that week, I ended up casting my vote uh, for John McCain. Would I make that same vote today? Probably not. Uh, but, you know, one thing I did, the reason I did vote for him was because my grandfather served 20 years in the military. And, you know, through the research that I had to do for this assignment, I found out about his, um, you know, career in the military, which is something that you know, resonated with me because, you know, I grew up seeing American flags everywhere. You know, all of my you know, grandfather's medals and, and certificates and all of those things. And so military service has always been something that's been near and dear to my heart and, and definitely have a deep Deep appreciation for all of those who served. And so I can jump in and ask you a question. Was your family conservative by background? Were they Republican, yeah. Democrat, non-political? What was the so, what, so you, what kind of home were you raised in? Yeah, so conservative value system, but loyal Democrat voters. So they've always been a Democrat. They voted for President Obama. Um, and they they weren't Trump fans at all, but conservative that value system. You know, I, I grew up going to church every single Sunday, Wednesday, Bible study. Um, I grew up with a strong emphasis on family and tradition and the value of a dollar. And so it's always funny when, you know, my parents are like, oh my God, I have no idea you turned out this way. I'm like, you're the reason I turned out this way. My, my mother uh, thought the same thing. My mother was shocked I turned out to be a conservative. Yeah. And it's like, I grew up surrounded by these values that, you know, are just textbook conservative values. And for me, you know, I didn't grow up, you know, I, I'm actually so fortunate that I got involved in politics at such a young age because I was totally naive to this idea that the color of my skin should dictate my politics. I had no idea what identity politics were, so I wasn't limited by that. Uh, you know, yeah, you were you were seven, you were eight. Right. You I was seven. Know what I had no were. idea that like black people were supposed to vote Democrat, white people were supposed to vote Republican. All I knew is that different political parties had different values, and I should be a member of the one that shared my values and the values that I grew up around, the values that made sense to me because of that upbringing were conservative values that aligned with the Republican Party. And so, you know, following that election, you know, that is really the 2008 election. That's when I really wanted to find out where do I stand? 
Um, you know, and so I looked at the platform, the Democrat Party. I watched MSNBC. I watched CNN. I looked at the platform, the Republican Party. I watched Fox News. I watched old CPAC speeches on YouTube. I remember um, just trying to figure out, like, where did I stand on these, you know, on these fundamental issues? So as a, as a 10 year old, you were a life of the you were the life of the party, weren't you? Right. You know, what was interesting, <laughs> what's so interesting is that, like, I had like a pretty normal childhood. Like, this is just one of those interests that was like very unique to me, but um you know i you know i still grew up like watching like you know cartoon network and you know all and spongebob or whatever um it was just like i just was i was hooked on politics for some reason and so um you know i eventually i you know i realized that you know the values that i had were republican values and and, I, and so i formally joined the republican party um as formally as one can do at uh, 11 or 10. Um, but i i did that and then um, the first campaign I ever worked on, I was actually 11 years old. I was going into seventh grade and it all actually started out of a Boy Scout assignment. So we had to meet with an elected official for one of our rank requirements. And I remember meeting with our Democrat incumbent congressman. And I remember leaving that meeting and saying, wow, this guy sucks. Like he should not be in office. And so the next day, the first call I made was to his Republican opponent um, who was going to go against him in the general election. I was like, I want to volunteer for you. I want to work for you. Uh, and then I come there the next day, show up to the campaign office in a suit. And now that was the first mistake, though, because I come in the suit, didn't know we were going to be door knocking that day. And if you've ever been to Georgia in the thick of the summer, the last thing you want to be doing uh, is door knocking uh, in a suit. So I did yeah. that, though, fell in love with the work, fell in love with just talking to voters and, and just campaigning on, you know, and campaigning in general, uh, which was super fun. And then following that experience, I'm the type of kid that has to stay busy, that likes to stay active. Uh, and so I made this YouTube video uh, in February of 2015, uh, kind of going after Obama. And, and some of your listeners may remember this. This is when Rudy Giuliani had criticized President Obama and said that he didn't really love America. And all these people you know, did their textbook, their textbook responses. They loved to do so much. They called him a racist. They called him a bigot. They said he would never say that about a white man, blah, 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 blah. Now, even 12 year old CJ knew that this was absolutely absurd. And, and, and I knew what this was coming, what this was all about. They were essentially making the argument that because he is black, that he is above criticism, that you should not be allowed to criticize him because of the color of his skin. Now, I actually believe that, that is racism within itself, but that's an entirely different conversation. Uh, that's called the bigotry of low expectations. I think that President Obama is enough of a man to take criticisms, and I think that it's an absolute cop-out to accuse everyone and anyone who disagrees with him of racism just because it's easy to do. And also, too, when there are many people in the Black community who share the same criticisms and concerns about the first Black president who really didn't do all that much for Black people. And so I made this video kind of calling him out. I rolled out of bed one day. Um, and I just was talking to the camera, just all from the heart, getting it off my chest, no, nothing written down or anything. I just like had some things to say and I posted on YouTube, had no expectations of it to go anywhere or to go viral or anything like that. It absolutely exploded overnight, getting, you know, around 2 million or so views. Yeah. I, I remember seeing it when it first happened. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And it was so surreal because it was just like, you know, <laughs> if you would have talked to six or seven year old CJ who was on the floor of his parents' bedroom watching the debate and saying, I want to do something like this one day. I want to have a voice. I want to be, you know, influential in, in some way and, and make change. He would have never believed that he would be given this platform six or so years later at the age of 12. And they just really talk about some of the biggest uh, and most important issues facing our country at the time. And so I continued on that path. I have continued on that path today uh, because what I really want to show is, is two things. Number one, that not all black people think the same. We are not a monolith uh, and that the color of your skin should not ever dictate your politics. I mean, so it's really ridiculous. All white people don't believe the same. All Chinese people don't believe the same. All black people, don't, all women don't think the same. All men don't think the same. Like, it's just so amazing to me that uh, that that is even insinuated that, you know, of course, in the last election where he said, you know, if 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 you don't know who to vote for, then you ain't black. Right. Yeah. Because if you're black, then like you just said, everybody has to think the same, vote the same. And it's ludicrous in no matter what race you're talking about. Yeah. And let's talk about the fundamental racism that underlies that entire argument that because of, you know, that we should be dick told how to vote because of some uncontrollable characteristic that we had nothing to do with, right? Uh, and like, you know, Joe Biden's comment was just, it was the, the quiet part finally being said out loud that there these yeah. white liberals believe that if we don't vote the way they believe that we should vote, that they can discredit our blackness as if they have some authority uh, to do so. 
And, and it's absolutely disgusting. And one of the biggest reasons that I think that it's so easy to rebel against these people, because I refuse to be owned by anyone. You know, yeah. it's so interesting that, you know, when, you know, Kanye West caused a stir, you know, last year or so, or two years ago, when he said that, you know, that this is like a modern day slavery, because like, literally, like you have Joe Biden telling people that, they are not black anymore if they don't support his campaign, which which we're looking at today and, and the effects of his presidency has disadvantaged black people more than it's helped them. I, I, if you ask any black Joe Biden supporter, what has Joe Biden done for you? They have no answer ever. But I can tell you what he hasn't done for them. He hasn't made any uh, dent in gas prices. He hasn't filled the grocery store shelves. He hasn't, you know, limited inflation. This is a man who probably has to be reminded every single day that he is president of the United States, right? And so, you know, and, and, and but I think, you know, to that point, though, I think that this was an important moment for America to have to go through because we got, we got a little too comfortable during the Trump years. Things were a little too good, right? You know, we had more jobs than we had people to fill them. We had the lowest black unemployment rate, the lowest Latino unemployment rate. We had, you know, stock market gains that have been never been seen before. We had a president who knew how to lead. We were respected on the world stage and we didn't have Russia poking around and trying to invade other countries. Why? Because we had a, we had a president who knew how to be president. Yeah, uh, knew how to be a leader, knew how to be tough, knew how to set an yeah. agenda. Let me ask you this. Um, how did black folks respond to you becoming so prominent? Your, your friends, your family, uh, just random folks you met, were they discouraging or encouraging to you or a mixture of both? Yeah, yeah, it's a mixture of both. You know, there are definitely those people, those keyboard warriors online who, you know, will call you every name in the book and Uncle Tom sell out. Any black conservative who's active and vocal has heard them all. Uh, but then there are also those people who I think appreciate just people who independently think for themselves and who have thoughts of their own. And, you know, it's interesting. I was just at, I was at Mar-a-Lago uh, last week or two weeks or so ago. And mm -hmm. the, the rapper Kodak Black, who is a, a huge rapper, uh, was there and he loves Donald Trump and he loves everything that he's doing and he loved everything that he did for the country. And there was another rapper. Or singer. Well, the, the rap world loved Trump until he got into politics. Yeah. Go back and look at how many times rappers talked about Donald Trump in their raps, right? Yeah. Yeah, he was he was the symbol of success and prosperity and everything yeah. that they wanted to achieve. And the thing is, is that a lot of these rappers still respect the hell out of them. They may not be as vocal about it and they may, you know, because of cancer culture, they may not, you know, vocalize it at all, but they still have that same respect for the man that they do. And, you know, just this past weekend, I was at the Trump rally in Commerce, Georgia, and Waka Flocka was there. And, uh, you know, and to those here listening, you may not know those names, Google them, I guarantee your kids do. Um, and these, these are huge deals. And for these celebrities to come out, these prominent figures in the black community come out and say, like, Joe Biden, we're not with him anymore. Like, we yeah. want Trump back is a huge deal and is showing, I think, the cultural reset that is happening in America that has been accelerated by the failure of this administration. And that's why I always say, you know, yes, should, Do should Donald Trump be president today? Yes. Unequivocally so, yes. But do I think that this was an important lesson? that needed to be taught to people across the country about how easily good times can leave us and how prosperity and freedom are not things that should be taken for granted. Also, yes, I think this was an important juncture uh, for us to, you know, just have to, you know, have to just kind of toughen up and go through. And I think hopefully at the end of the day, yeah, I think we'll get the first indication of this in the midterms. We're going to see a lot of people are waking up and they're saying, you know, Joe may be a nice guy, but, he's not he's not the president well you were too young to remember but the last nice guy that we hired to be president of the united states probably maybe the nicest guy and frankly joe biden is not a nice guy but he he portrays the image that he's a nice guy you know ah shucks you know just joe it's good old joe lunchbox joe, joe right in the amtrak you know um but the the last nice guy that we hired for the job was jimmy carter and uh, he was a nice guy and he was the second worst president. Well, at the time he was the worst president ever. But now I think every single day he thanks God for Joe Biden because Joe Biden is quickly becoming the worst president of the United States we've ever had. So um, so let's shift gears a little bit and let's talk about colleges. You're there at University of Alabama and, you know, University of Alabama. And we have another daughter goes to a, another school as well. 
Um, University of Alabama is pretty conservative. I've been there a lot over COVID. I went there, you know, parents weekends, things like that. So you're in a pretty good spot as far as uh, as far as colleges goes. And Tuscaloosa is a conservative town. And, you know, I remember there being no masks, you know, even dead heat of, of COVID, those kinds of things. But college in general is a real challenge for kids. Um even at Alabama, I know that there's some pressure, but you get outside of the South and you go almost anywhere else, there is this, uh, it's almost like a machine that takes in kids and spits out liberals. Um, what's the real challenge right now on college campuses as you see it? You know, I was at the University of Alabama, like you said, one of definitely one of the more conservative universities across the country, especially public universities and, and and in terms of size as well. I think we have an undergraduate enrollment of more than 37,000 students. And so it's a pretty big deal for us to be as, as conservative as we are. Now, with saying that, that does not make it easy all the time. You know, there are definitely certain institutions that are predominantly liberal controlled. Um, you know, our campus, you know, for some background here, I'm currently a senator in our student government association where, you know, we all have to run for office, we get elected by our peers and all those good things. And it was interesting because the day before election day, um, our school newspaper, which is completely controlled by, by liberals. Of course the, it is. Every newspaper is controlled yeah, by right? liberals. It's, it's, it's literally creating, it, like, like that machine, it's creating the next like little Anderson Coopers and Don Lemon to, and, and Chris yeah. Cuomo's, to be quite frank, um, yeah. you know, who are going to fill America's new, newsrooms uh, and, not, and, and not too far away. <laughs> uh, but they, cre- they wrote this op-ed basically saying that my election, if I were to be reelected, because I, I also won my freshman year, if I were to be reelected to the Senate, that it would pose a grave threat to the historically marginalized communities on our campus. Last time I checked, I was black, Chris. And so historically marginalized, it's interesting that you're saying that the reelection of a black senator, because I am Republican and conservative, um, would harm my community. And what's also interesting, this may not surprise you, is that the author of this piece was a white liberal, right? Telling me, a black man, that my reelection would hurt other black people. And, you know, what's interesting is the way they built this case was through an entire guilt by association attempt. They said, oh, he's taking pictures with Mass and Cawthorn. He's taking pictures with Marjorie Taylor Greene. His podcast is produced by Newt Gingrich, who used to, you know, be opposed to gay marriage. And so they were like, oh, he must be a bigot too. Well, number one, opposing gay marriage is a matter of religion and, and, and whatnot or whatever. And also to the, that point, Barack Obama was also opposed exactly. to gay marriage at yeah. one point. So is Barack Obama a bigot? Like, I, like what's what's the argument there? And so for me, you know, I was like, here's the deal. You know, I'm not going to worry about this piece. People who know me know my values. They know where I see on these issues. And they know that I just simply love America. And I'm never going to apologize for loving this country, supporting President Trump. And I'm certainly never going to apologize for taking a picture with people that I admire and that I respect. But, but that's the country. devious aspect. It's the devious and demented racism that white liberals and the liberal, even African-American liberals, whatever, the liberalism's devious racism is you are only as black as your ideology. Right. And, and, and that is, it's, it's not content of character. It's not the, uh, the weight of your argument. It's none of that. It's simply, do you check the box? And if you do, you're black. And if you don't check the box, you're not black. Nobody would ever say this about a white person. I, who would say, wait a minute, you're white. You've got to be a Republican. Nobody yeah. would say that. Yeah. You know, uh, and yet the the left does that all the time, and it's really devious and demented, and and really, in my opinion, evil, um, because as we go back to what we were talking about a little bit earlier, it just presupposes that everybody's supposed to fit into whatever they're told they're supposed to fit into without the ability or or the um, the idea that somebody could actually believe differently. You're right. And then the left uses those same character assassination campaigns that I was just referencing Mm -hmm. as a, as a mechanism of control, because what college kid wants to be thought of as a racist, a sexist or, or anti-gay or whatever, um, 
you know, by their friends or their family or future employers even, right? And so that's what they use. They use this, uh, this, this platform that they have that they've created because they, they control the media. You know, they're loud, they're rowdy. They love to protest. We don't do that because why we have jobs. And so we have, you know, bills to pay, but they, you know, they're never opposed to, you know, having a reason to protest or circulating a petition. And so. So you won the election anyway. Yeah, that's how they signed. Young what, what percentage of kids vote in that election at, at uh, University of Alabama? So we have around, I think in this recent election, 28% of our campus voted. And interestingly enough, after that piece came out, I actually got more votes than I did my freshman year. And I got the most votes of anyone running for Senate, yeah, which I think to that point is, you know, is a sign that people are sick and tired of this cancel culture BS. We're sick and tired of having our values and our opinions belittled and associated with things that we obviously do not endorse or approve because they're seeking to push this narrative that people are not allowed to think how they want to think. You know, for people that are so hell bent on talking about diversity, equity, and inclusion, what about diversity of viewpoint? What about equity between liberal thoughts and conservative thoughts? What about the inclusion of different opinions that may make you uncomfortable, but deserve to have a place in the intellectual debate of these issues. Uh, it just goes to show that these people never actually believe what they say. It just makes them feel good. So they say it out loud a lot. Um, but that's what I would say to those, you know, on other campuses throughout the country is just know that you are not alone. There are so many people who share your values, who share your convictions, who share your ideas and, and your beliefs, but just know that sometimes the left is a little bit louder. And it's not necessarily louder because there are more of them. They're just the squeaky chihuahua in the room who doesn't know how to stop talking, right? And so that's how we, I think, get ourselves a little intimidated, but don't be intimidated. Like know that there will be always be people in behind you in your corner who are gonna back you up and fight for you. You know, I remember, um, you know, recently on, on January, I went to the <clears throat> president's event on January 6th at the Ellipse, um, was not at the Capitol or anything like that, never entered the Capitol. Uh, and I was at the president's event and, uh, you know, took a picture, you know, voicing my support for the president and this girl who was the president of the socialist club on campus created this petition, basically saying that I needed to be ex expelled from school, that I had no place at the university of Alabama. Um, all while coincidentally having Black Lives Matter in her Instagram bio, which is interesting to me because if Black Lives Matter is to you so much, why are you trying to take a black man's education away? But I, I got to tell you, these folks are ruthless. Yeah, they're, yeah, they're ruthless. It is blood sport for them. It yeah. is their religion, and they will live and die for their God, which is state control. It, it's it, conservatives need to realize how ruthless the left is. They right. they right. pretend to be the tolerant. They wrap themselves in the flag of tolerance, but they are willing to do whatever it takes to win. Yeah, and we also have to be able to fight back. You know, with that petition, I was like, you know, I could have threw in the towel. I could have made some BS apology. I didn't really believe that. You know, I was ashamed of you know, President Trump and all this stuff. No, I will never say that. I completely support President Trump. And so what I did, I said, well, I'm going to make a petition of my own, a petition that says that we're going to stand to cancel culture, that I'm going to stay at the University of Alabama and sign it if you believe in free speech. Her petition got 4,000 signatures. Mine got 80,000 signatures. And I think it just, again, it just goes to show that people are sick and tired of the left's just authoritarian campaign to control the things that people like you and I say and the things and the, and the things that we think as well. Yeah. So um, give us some tips for survival. I'm going to ask you, I'm going to ask you two questions as we sort of wrap up. First of all, speak to college kids who are seeing this, some tips for survival, uh, especially those who go to really left-wing schools. And then I want to ask you a follow-up question. And that is some advice to parents and some older folks who, who want to support kids who are in college and help them get through without, uh, you know, all these pressures and troubles. Yeah, so some of the tips that I would say is that, and this is, even applies here at the University of Alabama, where there's a lot more conservatives um, here than you probably would find at other universities, just find a community of people that share your beliefs and values. Um, you know, it's always great to have a community of people you can talk about the things that are going on in the country um, and just really vent sometimes, because I think that's just an important, just therapeutic way to just get through a lot of the nonsense that's happening. Are, are there still clubs? Are there still Republican clubs, conservative clubs, uh, those kinds of things on college campuses? Yeah, so we have the college Republicans. There's tons of Turning Point USA chapters. So there's tons of uh, you know means to you know get involved and get involved in kind of a conservative community of people. So definitely find those on your campus. And also too is just stay informed because what 
I always say to people is that the left has emotion on their side, but we have the facts on our side, right? And so as long as the facts are on your side, they can call you every name in the book, but that doesn't make you any less right. Because the truth is objectively always going to be the truth, regardless of whether or not they call you a racist, a sexist, a bigot, or any of that. It doesn't make anything you're saying less true as long as it's factually supported by real information and all that information is on our side. We know that the economy works best when small businesses aren't burdened by crazy regulations uh, that force them to not be able to hire as many employees or not be able to increase wages to the point that they, that, that they, that they could be. We know that raising the minimum wage uh, actually eliminates jobs. Yes, living wage sounds like something that everyone should support. Who doesn't want? They replace them with. Uh, they replace them with those little terminals where you can right. order your yeah. food that way. Yeah. Yeah. So they say living wage, but is it really a living wage if the people that are that we want to live now have no job, no income, no wage, replaced by robots, like you just said? And yeah. so you know, the the left is very good at marketing, very good at you know phrasing and messaging and all mm -hmm. these things, and the right hasn't been as good at that. Um, but just always know that, you know, so be intentional about the way you talk about these issues and always, of course, have the facts on your side uh, and, and just have that confidence, conviction and have courage, really more so than anything, have courage, because there are so many people in any at any given time in your college lecture hall, in your classroom who share your ideas and who share your beliefs. They're just scared to raise their hand and vocalize them. But if you were to be the one to raise your hand and you were to be the one to say, hey, I disagree with what you just said, Professor So-and-so, because this, this, and that, it may give someone the courage to raise their hand the next time. Or maybe they're going to talk to their friends after class and say, oh, this person in class made this really good point, and I think it changed my mind about this. There's, can, there's an old quote that says, when we show courage, we give other people backbone. And exactly. I love that. And, and you're right. The kids who are watching today and who are listening to you, you if you show courage, other people will get backbone. They might be sitting back waiting, like, is anybody going to say anything? You might be in a room of 50 people and 30 of you might be conservatives, but the liberals are the ones that are opening their mouth and screaming and yelling. And the conservatives kind of just sit there and go, are there any of us in here? Well, if one of you raises his hand boldly and with confidence and says, hey, here's the deal, then it makes the other people go, oh, he's saying... Yeah, I agree with him, you know, and all of a sudden it gives everybody the courage and you rise up together. It's a really important point you're making there. You know, exactly. And, and to the parents that are watching here, uh, I think that, you know, this is kind of biblical in a sense, but, you know, my mom would say it all the time, my grandparents would as well, is raise up a child in the way that they should go when they're old, they won't depart from it. Um, and I think that, you know, before you send your kids off to college and you know what they're going to, they're, what they're going to experience, what they're going to run into there, um, just make sure they know about, you know, America, make sure that they know about the principles that make America what it is, that they know the value of freedom, liberty, um, and that they have the confidence and the courage to just not be a group thinker, right? And not be just yeah. kind of um, an intellectual coward. Make sure that they're willing to, you know, have conversations with people. And I think, of course, let your kid make up their own mind about the issues and make sure that they're like presented this information in an objective way. Um, I, I paid some of my kids, I paid them $5 for every five minute Prager U video they watched. <laughs> so, yeah. So yeah. I basically yeah. was paying them 60 bucks an hour, right? A buck a minute. You watch a five minute Prager U video, you get yeah. five bucks because yeah. I wanted to incentivize them to start putting in those short little bite sized ideas and arguments and all those kinds of things yeah exactly and that's huge because when they go on a college campus like and and, and people you know left like to say oh so you're saying to do reverse indoctrination you know the these professors aren't ashamed to preach no. what they're preaching they're not ashamed to say that donald trump is this or that that america is a racist nation or anything like that and they're not ashamed to punish you for disagreeing with them right they they're not they're not they they will lose no sleep giving you an f over paper that they nothing have because they're brutal and they are blood sport exactly right. and so why should our parents who love america who love this country be ashamed to share that love with their with their children they shouldn't be uh because th this is the how the left went so the left went because when you know kids you know they go to college they're not thinking that they've never thought about politics ever they've had no reason really to they haven't voted right. or anything like that so the first time they're hearing about politics, because a lot of parents are just like, oh, I'm not going to talk to politics with my kid because they don't really care. That it doesn't really matter right now, whatever. So the first introduction they have to politics is from their left wing professor in poly 101 or whatever. And they're like, oh, like 
I didn't know that America was a historically racist nation. I know America was still racist today. I didn't know that there were 1800 genders. I didn't know that all of these things were true. Well, they're not true, but they are these opinions that are presented by these professors as absolute matters of fact. And so because and you, have, have, and you have a grade hanging in the balance, right. if you agree with this man or woman, exactly. right? So there's that, there's that other insidious pressure on you. Yep. Well, maybe I disagree with it, but maybe I should just say that I agree with it because I don't want to get an F, right? And, yeah. and so now they're pressuring you the same way they do at work 20 years later. They yeah. pressure you and they finagle you and they shame you in order to move you into their camp. It's, it's yeah. really, it's terrible. Exactly. And, and of course, it's intimidating for any freshman student or even any college student really to stand up to someone with a PhD behind their name. But I think that if you <clears throat> equip, you know, your, your, your kids with in the same way that you did, like just, you know, have them watch some prayer you videos, have them, you know, follow some different folks on Twitter and Instagram who, you know, who, who would appeal to them and who break down conservatism and are really. What, uh, what, what books have you read that have made an impact books or videos or movies that you've read that have made an impact on you and helped you formulate? Yeah. So Prager is a great resource. Uh, you know, yeah. I would say they, they do a really good job at storytelling. I, you know, got to actually do a Prager review video myself, which was really fun experience. And the way they break down these really important issues of Americanism and patriotism and just any really hot butt political issue is great. I would definitely recommend them. Uh, you know, my grandfather's son by Clarence Thomas is very, very good. Um, love that book. Dinesh D'Souza's books are always great. Yeah, they're um, great. So will, I would definitely recommend almost everything he's written there. Basic economics to start um, would be great. And then just, I think just also too, for people, I'm more of a visual person like YouTube wise. And so it's like, you know, look at a few like CPAC speeches, listen to what people are saying there and just kind of like, you know, find your own type of conservatism. Like when I first started out, you know, I was just a Republican. And then, you know, then of course I kind of figured out, okay, like I'm not an establishment kind of guy. Like I'm not a Jeb Bush. I'm more of a, you know, Ted Cruz or a Trump or like, the, you know, that, that's where I was in the ideological scale. And so I think that the deeper you dive into it, the more, of course, you'll fine tune your own perception of where you actually leave because no Republican is the same, um, you know, either. Like just because we're all Republicans doesn't mean we'll always agree. And I think that that is the beauty of it all. And what separates us from the other side is that we are still not afraid and unafraid uh, to think for ourselves. Yeah. Awesome. Well, CJ Pearson, thanks for joining us. Uh, appreciate you folks. Be sure to go look him up on Instagram, Twitter, uh, any place on your social media, uh, whatever platform you're using, search for CJ Pearson. He is uh, he's a guy that's going to give you a lot of hope for our country because he's a, a leader in this movement as the uh, Gen Z. You're Gen Z. Am I right? Yes. Yeah. The young, the young kids, there's a lot of conservatives and they need some folks like CJ who are leading the pack and, and uh, giving people that courage and that backbone that they need. CJ, thanks for joining us. Thanks so much for having me. All right, everybody. That's another American Freedom Tour podcast. Be sure to hit the like, be sure to hit the share, the stars, the whatever buttons you can hit in order to tell people that it's a great thing and a great place to come and get great information. We will see you on the American Freedom Tour. You can go to AmericanFreedomTour.com, find out what cities we're coming to. You can go if it's local or you can even fly in. One of our events, we had people from 27 different states. So be sure to join us on the American Freedom Tour at AmericanFreedomTour.com and share this podcast with some other folks. With that, I will talk to you next time. Take care. Bye-bye.